I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Muammar Gaddafi, the dictator of Libya, a state which we need intimately because of its light, sweet crude. You see the price of gasoline. You see the price of oil. You see the grave concern that without Libya, Europe and the global economy struggles. What can we learn about, a new, uh, uh, about Muammar Gaddafi from a new book, Theories of International Politics and Zombies? I'm not stretching the point here. Muammar Gaddafi, since the breakdown of civil order in Libya, has evidenced all the classic signs of being reanimated flesh. In fact, right now, you'd have to say Muammar Gaddafi is the best living example we have on television of what a zombie would look like if, if he was the head of a dictatorship. Daniel Dresner, writing Theories of International Politics and Zombies, just published, is a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tets, Tufts University. Dan and I have spoken before because he wrote a preview of his wonderful book some months ago in a distinguished magazine, but now I have the book itself, and we have Gaddafi for an example. So though he doesn't write of Gaddafi in his book, he's being very careful as a professor to apply what we know about international relations schools to the general understanding of what if zombies had their own state and how would we respond. I'm sure that he's playful enough to enter into this specific example. Dan, congratulations. This book is very funny. And because it's true comedy, it's also very tragic. We have treated many of the dictators of the 20th century now into the 21st just as if they were zombies with all schools apparent. Congratulations, and tell me about Muammar Gaddafi. Have we used all the classic international relations schools with him? Well, first of all, I, th I think you have to think visually. Um, I I've never seen a, a living human being that looks more like a zombie than, than Gaddafi at this point. Uh, you know, you, you take a look at some of the recent pictures, and, and you, you have to wonder uh, when was the last time he was actually eating another human being. Um, definitely looks like a zombie. But I'm sorry, but... Um, we have used, you can argue, you know, most of the, the major paradigms in international relations against Gaddafi. Um, probably the first one that, that people would remember is, is uh, actually neoconservatism. Um, the idea behind neoconservatism is the notion that uh, you want the rest of the world to be democratic uh, because democratic governments generally treat each other better. Where neocons uh, are distinct is in believing that there can be forcible regime change, that you can use military power as a way to cause a population to rise up and, and overthrow dictators. So in 1986, for example, uh, the Reagan administration bombed uh, various uh, aspects in Libya, uh, various parts of Libya, um, in an attempt to punish that country for uh, its support of terrorist activities in Europe. But I think one of the secret hopes of the Reagan administration was that this would cause a, uh, the population to rise up and overthrow their undead oppressor. Uh, that didn't work terribly well, um, although it, it didn't necessarily lead to uh, devastating consequences either. Um, the, uh, the next policy that was done, you could argue, was sort of realpolitik, realism. Um, and a realist approach to zombies, uh, you know, is sort of a live and let live approach, which is, uh, you know, it, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog or man-eat-man -man world out there. And therefore, you know, you certainly protect your national interest, but you don't necessarily act too aggressively um, in dealing with the undead threat. So the realist approach basically imposed containment on Libya, um, saying that so long as, as Gaddafi was still intent on pursuing weapons of mass destruction, he was going to be kept in the box. And then in 2003, uh, in response both to the increasing pressure of the sanctions and um, the Iraq invasion, he agreed uh, to give up his WMD program, um, and in return the sanctions were slowly lifted. So that would be the realist policy. Uh, you can argue that the liberal policy um, – was after that, which was that the uh, the way to uh, to deal with Gaddafi was to cooperate with him, was to be you know, was to uh, assure him that it was a, a non-zero sum world out there, that if you know we cooperate, he should cooperate as well, um, and so as a result, the idea was that through trade or things like that, you would be, uh, slowly get a change in the Libyan regime. And we, we embraced him. We put him on significant international bodies. In fact, we we traveled to Gaddafi, uh, the head, Ban Ki Moon, the head of the General, General Secretary of the United Nations, traveled there, and uh, Gaddafi in Libya chaired significant international relations boards. That's true. I believe Libya was a former chair of the UN Human Rights Council, right. which it was just kicked off of. Right, and that's good liberalism. 
Well, I mean, that's, I'm not sure even liberals would go that far, but uh, that would certainly be a, an example of that paradigm. Yeah. Um, and then finally, there is constructivism, which is not terribly well known outside of, uh, of academic international relations. But the idea behind constructivism is that you can actually socialize actors, uh, bad actors in world politics, to make them act more like responsible uh, stakeholders in the international system, and that by altering these states' identities and, and getting them to embrace new norms, um, they would potentially be you know, con more constructive uh, parts of the international system. And indeed, I think one of the most recent, uh, one of the most interesting parts of, of what's happened with Gaddafi has been all of these uh, stories that have come out over the last five years about how the Monitor Group has been sending high powered uh, international relations scholars and public intellectuals to meet with Gaddafi. Um, you know, you've seen Benjamin Barber, uh, Joseph Nye, Bob Putnam. Uh, these are, you know, intellectual heavyweights, all of whom trying desperately to convince Gaddafi. Um, that the, uh, a, a more democratic form of government and a, a embrace of globalization is the way to go. Um, I think it would be safe to say that given what's happened in Libya now, that that was a failed uh, experiment and that didn't work out terribly well um, and indeed embarrassed at least a few of those public intellectuals who had to interact with him. I'm speaking with Daniel W. Dresner, and his book is Theories of International Politics and Zombies. It is written very carefully with uh, many refu uh, uh, references to the zombie cannon, which has accelerated in these last years of the 21st century. In fact, uh, some incredible percentage of zombie movies and zombie books have co been coming th uh, since the turn of the century. Right. We're applying the lessons just to Muammar Gaddafi, but it, it speaks to many nations and many states as we are here in the 21st century. So when we come back, I want to take Dan's book and apply it to what we know about other international bodies and how we deal not with Muammar Gaddafi, but it without all with all zombie states. And the first thing we'll do is define a zombie. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. I'm continuing my conversation with Dan Dresner, whose book has the advantage of being at once absurd and deadly earnest, because we're talking about reanimated flesh and what international relations can respond can do to respond to the inevitable onslaught of zombies who are very carefully defined in Dan's book Dan uh, we have three definitions of zombies uh, the one is they only eat human flesh uh, is that only brains of human flesh or all human flesh well, this is uh, some uh, dispute within the zombie canon. Uh, it depends on which movie you look at. I think the general assumption is, is that zombies will eat all human flesh. Um, but in Return of the Living Dead, um, it was that was the first movie which came out in 1985. Um, which, uh, you had zombies talking about, you know, trying to eat brains and so forth. Right. Um, but, no, generally most zombie movies... Um, uh, they're, they're willing to eat any aspect of human flesh. And in the original, the black and white original produced by George Romero back in the 60s, gosh, that was long ago, mm -hmm. before reanimated flesh were a world force, uh, they ate everything. Uh, yes. And the people marching across the uh, terrain didn't care whether it was brains or not. Now, there is another aspect of uh, zombies that, are, that is critical to understand how, t when you're dealing with them as a state, a human state, dealing with a zombie state. And that's the, there's only one way they can be destroyed. How, Dan? Well, the only way you can destroy a zombie, according to the rules of the zombie canon, is you have to destroy their brain. Right. If you, you know, if you chop off a limb, if you shoot them in the heart, if you, you chop off a leg, that's not going to do anything. Um, they're just going to keep on coming with whatever limbs they have remaining. Right, right. You can knock them down with a blast of a big weapon, but they're going to get up and kim come back at you. Right, and this is important because there's been a lot of talk about potentially using nuclear weapons in the case of a zombie uh, apocalypse, and that would actually be disastrous because while you would inevitably incinerate some zombies um, very close to the nuclear blast point, in fact, most people who, who are, uh, die from a nuclear blast die from the radiation rather than the actual um, blast itself. And, and, of course, if you deal think about this with zombies you have the worst thing uh, the only thing worse than a, uh, a zombie army which is a mutant radioactive zombie army now the third aspect of this is very critical to understand why zombies are a threat anyone bitten by a zombie will become a zombie but we don't know how long it'll take Right, and this actually uh, it varies from movie to movie, and this is important. The only thing zombies want to do is eat human flesh. They're not interested in eating other zombies because, well, that's just gross. But, you know, if they, eat, if they bite a human, 
the human will automatically, you know, will eventually become a zombie. And so this is different from any other kind of pathogen that we would think about, like even AIDS or Ebola, which have very high infection rates, but 100% infection rate is unheard of. In, the, in reviewing the zombie canon, uh, do you find it conscious on the part of uh, authors? We have literary authors here. We have screenplay writers. We have B-movie writers. We've mentioned George Romero, who is, you'd have to say, the Alfred Hitchcock of zombie movies. Is there a, an agreed-upon list of rules, or have they been uh, pretty much uh, going along on their own pace and there's discord among them? Um, I would say the rules that I just told you are the one, you know, the rules that are generally in, in common with all zombie movies. Although even there, you know, t the movies like 28 Days Later or 28 Weeks Later, technically those people aren't dead; they're just really infected. Right. Uh, the, but the rage virus. Right. Called. The rage virus. But everyone still thinks of them as as zombies. So I do talk about them in the book. No, I would say beyond those rules, there's actually a lot of a, a lot of room to play with. Um, so how fast the zombies can move, you know, fast or slow, the way in which people become zombies is either supernatural or biological or radiological. Um, the intelligence of the zombies also varies dramatically from movie to movie or from book to book. Um, so no, in fact, there's, there's a fair amount of play within the zombie canon, except the notion that, you know, they're basically undead, and uh, if you're bitten by a zombie, you become a zombie. Now, one of the things I think I find most surprising in your discussion of international relations is to, uh, it does not signify if the zombies can move quickly or slow, if they can talk or not talk. Uh, all these varieties of zombiehood, including zombie organization and zombie sympathy, because eventually it comes down to the same state-to-state -state problem uh, fr uh, from the point of view of humans to zombies. Did I read you correctly, Dan? Well, the, the point I was trying to make, and I actually dealt with this explicitly in the book, is that you, know, you don't want to... Um you don't want to make too many assumptions about the capabilities of zombies. The fewer assumptions I make about them, um, the more elastic the theories want to be, the more useful the theories are in terms of explaining things. If you make an assumption about the zombie and it turns out the actual zombie wouldn't have those capabilities, then that you know, undercuts your theory. So, uh, so yeah, my argument about um, you know, whether zombies are fast or slow is in the end it doesn't matter. It, they would still become a cross-border problem. Uh all right, uh, cross-border problem. There, right. Therein is now the problem, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to apply the four schools that we did to Muammar Gaddafi right. to zombies. First, we'll start with the realism school. You've got a zombie state, or a series of zombie states, or zombie failed states. Uh, I love the philosophy uh, in your book somewhere where it's not a, it, it, zombies aren't the problem, it's what we make of them is the problem. So, so as, li, as a realistic international relations school, how do you approach zombiehood? Uh, what, would liberal, what would realism first want to achieve? Well, what realists would be, ought first be concerned about is what you know, affects the national interest of states. So they wouldn't necessarily be scared of the zombies, provided the zombies just simply maintain control within their own territory. It was only if the zombies acted in an expansionist manner that realists would start right. cautioning, you know, right. you have to balance against the zombies. So, you know, realists are, are basically undeterred by almost any change in the international system. Realists believe that the international system has been unchanging since the days of Thucydides. So their response to a, a zombie uh, attack or a zombie state is that, well, you know, anarchy is a really powerful constraint, and the zombie state will just eventually have to act like every other state. And that's a control mechanism that is important to establish here because international relations use, uses something called the anarchy control, the anarchy limit. What is that, Dan? Well, you know, anarchy is – it doesn't necessarily mean chaos or disorder. It just means there is no central government. It means that um, you know, you're living in a Hobbesian world um, in which uh, it potentially you – know, states that have sufficient amount of force can pretty much do anything they want. Um, you know, without any kind of uh, of sanction or, or international law judging them incorrectly. So, in that kind of anarchical system, um, realists argue that that system, you know, imposes very serious and binding constraints on states, and that even zombie states would have to learn how to adapt. You know, just as, as power is a scarce resource in world politics, realists would argue that, you know, brains are a scarce resource for zombies. So there, the international relations dynamics wouldn't be all that different. Now, would realists uh, vouchsafe trade with zombie states, uh, you know, the kind of uh, quid pro quo stuff? Um, realists would believe that the tacit alliances with states, with zombie states, would be possible. And indeed, you actually do see this in some of the movies, um, where there's sort of implicit cooperation between some zombies and some humans. Um, it, it's sort of more general trade. Uh, I think realists would be somewhat skeptical about that, but generally realists are usually skeptical about economic interdependence, period. All right. Now, uh, realists, and we see today uh, an example of realists dealing with what you'd have to say are 
qualified zombie states. North Korea would be one. Iran would be another. And is that realism uh, today sophisticated enough to deal with this? Are we seeing uh, right now the examples of zombiehood, although these are human states acting like zombie states? Right. Well, again, you know, what realists would caution is not being too aggressive uh, in dealing with these states. There's no doubt that these states should be contained because they, they represent a potential you know, menace to humankind. But realists are also very cautious about you know, being over, overly uh, uh, dramatic um, or you know, ratcheting things up to a crisis point when, in fact, that crisis doesn't necessarily have to happen. Um, so you know, realists, I think, would by and large be content with how, let's say, the Obama administration dealt with Iran, uh, for, has been dealing with Iran, um, and I think also would be probably reasonably happy with how they've dealt with North Korea, because North Korea has acted in a more belligerent manner uh, vis-a-vis other countries uh, for the last year. And so, therefore, that's, that's when it's actually also appropriate to respond um, and, and to indicate that you are not going to be uh, um, coerced or cow- uh, cowed by that kind of belligerent action. I'm speaking with Daniel Dresner. The book is Theories of International Politics and Zombies. We're going to turn to the next very tricky matter of how liberalism, international theory of liberalism, International Relations Theory of Liberalism deals with a zombie state. Remember, these are reanimated flesh uh, actors, and you're human. And you know, and so do the reanimated actors, that the only thing they want to do is eat your brains. That's part of the theory here. And that if they bite you, you will become infected, and so will your citizens. So cross-border is very dangerous, and liberalism is a very aggressively uh, peaceful mechanism of dealing with zombie states. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Dan uh, Dan Dresner's book is International Relations Theories of International Politics and Zombies. Dan, I find liberalism the most challenging, the most risk filled of all of the four schools. I understand neocons, and we'll talk about it, that in the moment. How does liberalism deal with a zombie state uh, in the best possible scenario? Well, there are ways in which you know the presence of zombies, you know contradicts some general assumptions that liberals make about the world, which is liberals believe that even if liberals are perfectly happy to acknowledge it's an anarchic world out there, they just believe that cooperation is still possible in an anarchic world, that there are opportunities for, you know, win-win cooperation. Um, and of course, the obvious problem is, is that, you know, when you're dealing with zombies, that is a pretty much a zero-sum, you know, bargaining situation where, you know, if the zombies win, you lose and vice versa. So liberals would initially be, uh, you know, a little bit flustered by the, the presence of actors that clearly see things in such a zero-sum context. And, However, uh, no, I just want to define liberalism before we go any farther. What, do, what is the international relation uh, theory of liberalism? The liberal theory of international politics says that even if you were in an anarchic environment, it is still possible to pursue policies that promote cooperation, namely uh, the promotion of economic interdependence, um, the creation of robust multilateral institutions that enforce whatever agreements there are among the member states, and the promotion of democracies, because it's generally positive that democracies are more likely uh, to adhere to the rule of law than non-democratic states. All right. Now, now we'll apply that back to uh, zombies. There are some obvious limits. I want to start with democracy because we hear this talk all the time now in the UMA where we're dealing with autocracies where the ruling regime has been anything but favorable to liberal th- or international relations all these years. How do you promote democracy in a reanimated flesh state? Well, I think the uh, the answer is is that the way that the liberals would see zombies, they actually wouldn't necessarily see them as zombie states. They would just see zombies as one of your classic externalities, one of your classic sort of public bads out there, like let's say global warming or the potential exist, you know, problem of global pandemics, um, or you know, terrorism for that matter. And therefore, they would argue that killing the undead uh, would be a major global public good. And so they would advocate the creation of robust 
uh, international organizations and the creation of a very strong global counter-zombie regime, perhaps even the creation of a world zombie organization uh, designed to combat the spread of the undead. And is that aggression? I mean, if you're in a position where you have to say, you know, if the other side wins, I'm going to be eaten. I mean, I'm not quite sure how liberalism... For example, we have... No, that, state, would, uh, but yes. that would actually be consistent with liberalism. I mean, consider, for example, how the Clinton administration dealt with, let's say, Serbia um, or uh, uh, with Bosnia and with Kosovo. Liberals are perfectly, you know, willing to be tough if they feel that cooperation is broken down completely. They're simply more optimistic that cooperation could occur in the first place. So that would be an example, then, for what we're seeing now with regard to some aspects of governance in the UMA. Uh, the liberal uh, body of the United Nations Security Council is only upset when it sees brutality directed against what it declares to be an un, uh, unprotected or unarmed civilian population. That's, that's too far for liberals. Right, that's exactly correct. So you can argue that what's happened you know, with the UN Security Council in Libya is an example, would be an example of, of liberal international politics, where you have even countries like China and Russia you know, that are not democratic, saying, yeah, but, you know, Gaddafi is clearly slaughtering his own population. That is a bridge too far even for them. So, you know, that's an instance where, in fact, you do see, you know, some kind of, of, of uh, global response. But zombies, or in this case, their mere uh, version, which would be Iran, have learned if you don't permit the cameras in and if you control social media so that there's no good reporting on the ground for the abuse of the zombie regime of its own people, then, therefore, the international liberal bodies don't complain as much or aren't aggression, uh, aren't aggressive in their uh, complaints about the Tehran regime. That's certainly an issue. And that, you know, one of the problems, which I talk about in the book, is that authoritarian states would actually probably be likely to hide some of their zombie problems, even if there was a global counter-zombie regime, because authoritarian governments generally don't like to admit that they have any kind of weaknesses. Um, so you're right that to some extent, part of the issue is how well these international institutions could actually monitor any kind of agreements on this front. And you're right, the, you know, the Iranians, for example, have gotten better at this kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, to some extent, just like there are good democracies and, and you know, not so great democracies, there are authoritarian governments that are relatively efficient or, you know, effective at least in their brutality. And then there are those that are frankly out of practice. And I think you saw that with Egypt, for example. And do we don't have in the zombie canon any way of talking about good zombies and bad zombies. For example, I'm just giving an example how we would say the bad zombies would be, say, have a religious impulse to impose themselves on a global zombie state, and the good zombies would be live and let z live zombies. We don't have anything like that in the canon, do we? Well, you can you can argue there is something like that. I mean, George Romero's Land of the Dead, for example, was a movie in which, in the end, the zombies did seem to sign of, you know, have a tacit kind of bargain with the remaining humans, of you know, we'll leave you alone and you leave us alone. I see. Whereas, it, it, in terms of the religious story you're talking about, uh, there is a novel by Brian Keane called The Rising. Um, in which the zombies are actually part of a sort of larger religious movement. Um, and uh, that that's a very brutal novel, though I wouldn't recommend that to most people. Uh, but the zombie canon allows all players, and it's still being developed. The zombie canon is, uh, we've not mentioned World War Z. Oh, yeah. Where, and we'll get to that in the neocon world, because right. there, there are neocon limits in World War Z. I want to now make a distinction, because we see in the UMA, for example, liberal international relations is seeking to separate uh, the Libyans from the bad Libyans. Libyans, the good Libyans from the bad Libyans, even though good Libyans could be armed and shooting people indiscriminately, we're declaring that they're the civilian uh, uh, agitators, they're the protesters, they're the demonstrators, and then the bad Libyans are the standing army that's loyal to Gaddafi or his hirelings, his mercenary hirelings. Is there anything in the zombie canon that allows us to split zombie states into two warring parties? No, I mean, that's in some ways the ways in which zombie, you know, why zombies are uh, thought of as so scary, because you very rarely see divisions among zombies um, in any aspect of the, of the, the right. movie or book canon. Um, and so that, you know, zombies very rarely turn on each other. Um, and that's in some ways what makes them uh, such a disturbing uh, threat for, uh, from the point of view of humans. And perhaps points up to the fact that we're deluding ourselves, Dan, to believe that uh, men with guns are not the, as bad as men with guns? 
Well, I mean, that, that would be the, the realist response. On the other hand, you know, th- there are limits to the way, how you can stretch this metaphor. Uh, I, you know, I do think it's fair to say— I haven't found any, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I just haven't found any. That's what's so wonderful about this. Once I got to thinking about it, I said, sure, fine, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's move on to neocons, because here's fun. This is World War Z, right. which is a very famous book, and it has to do with uh, war with zombies. And the neocons— uh, meet their limits. For example, there's one wonderful passage you quote in your book about how they all the preparation for fighting, I think they were in a neighborhood of New York, the Yon- Yonkers. Yonkers. Yes. They were taught to hit for, uh, to shoot for the center part of the body mass, which is really bad tactics when you're dealing with a zombie and you must have a headshot. And they were also wearing body armor. I don't know what point body armor is. Zombies just eat people. They don't use weapons. Right, and this was uh, well. I mean, this was. And there's an, another quote I think in the the book that uh, it was great that says, "What if you you know if the goal is to shock and awe your enemy? What happens if the enemy can't be shocked and awed? Right. Not just socially, but physically cannot be shocked and awed." Um, and that does suggest the limits of the neocon strategy uh, when it comes to zombies, which is the notion is, is that you would you know have an aggressive and militarized response, and that would somehow you know inspire. Uh, the uh, the human population to rise up against their undead oppressors um, who were shocked and awed into submission, and that obviously doesn't really work with the uh, the living dead. And in fact, it doesn't work anyway. I think in a footnote aside, you said that perhaps the neocon response would be not only to treat the zombie state that it was at war with, but also treat every other state that was like zombies and sort of one great big axis of the undead and then to invade Iraq just for old times' sake. <laughs> so. Yes, no, I, I did posit that the, the neocons would assume that there must be an axis of evil dead out there. Right, right. That the zombies must have gotten help from the Chinese, the Russians, the European Union. You Dan, know. you convinced me. I liked it. That's immediately <laughs> what the neocons would presume. In fact, I report on that all the time. I'm a, I'm a neocon when I report on that. The other night I was thinking, okay— uh, Osama bin Laden spent a few months in, uh, in Afghanistan uh, governance fighting the Soviets to show that he was a tough guy. This is 1985. Right. And it occurred to me he might have been recruited in those sm- several months he was fighting the Soviets, and they turned him around so that he then was an enemy of the United States. You see how neocons actually think. There we're, you go. we're not convinced that zombies are independent agents. We all think they work for Moscow. Well, the other thing that neocons, I mean, neocons are in this way opposite of realists, because ne- whereas realists believe that you balance against threats, neocons are, are strong believers in bandwagoning. So, in fact, neo- a lot of neocons embrace the same logic that Osama bin Laden did, which is you never back the weak horse, you always back the strong horse. What about nuclear weapons and zombies? Well, as I said before, I think uh, you know one of the ways in which zombies are an obvious challenge to uh, to conventional deterrence policy is that you know nuclear deterrence is based on the the presumption that uh, no state will actually use nuclear weapons because if you were to do so, you would obviously you know face a uh, immediate response and your country would be wiped out as well. Um, zombies would not necessarily operate along these lines um, <laughs> if. Uh, you know, first of all, if you you try to use nuclear weapons against zombies, I don't think you would kill nearly as many of them as you would expect, and instead you would create a mutant radioactive army of the undead, right. uh, which is a pretty serious problem if you think about it. And then, um, you know, if zombies were to get nuclear weapons, uh, I'm not really sure what they would. You know, this depends obviously whether you're dealing with smart or dumb zombies. Um, but that said, I, I strongly suspect the zombies would actually not use the nuclear weapons. Um, the reason being that why would you want to destroy all the human brains that you want to actually eat? Right. So a zombie nuclear state may be contradictory. There is another aspect of using neocons, and I think you make it very clear that you're putting your soldiers su- at such risk that you're actually sacrificing them. You can't get them back out of the co- of the combat zone. Right. And part of this, you know, is, is tied to the notion of the revolution of military affairs, which many neoconservatives are, are uh, enamored with. That you know, you would if you go in with too light a footprint. You know, you, you unfortunately would probably lose many of your soldiers to, in fact, the zombie insurgency itself. And then they would become zombie super soldiers who would have access to your system. I mean, they would they would be blowback. Uh, that could be a, f- a scenario that could occur, yes. So the neocon approach to a zombie state is about as bad as it gets. Of these four choices, you've now convinced me the neocon is the least successful when dealing with the undead. <laughs> Put it this way, unless you were able to, you know, have a dramatic surge of men and materiel and really went in with, uh, 
with you know a large part of uh, you know a large force to begin with. I, I'm pretty skeptical of the neocon approach. Yes, I'm speaking with Dan Dresner, theories of international politics and zombies. And when we come back, the one that Dan uh, has identified as the most academic of the four approaches, constructivism. It attracts me because it represents the world that I live in, which is the chattering classes dealing with the unacceptable as a world leader. I'm John Batchelor, coming to you from 77 WABC in the Small Business Authority Studios. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. And Dan's book is revelatory for all rogue and failed states, to my knowledge. But it's chiefly about the undead. And we'll, we'll return to that in a moment. Dan, will you identify constructivism again and how this theory works right now, not just about Gaddafi, but about in the world? Right. Well, what constructivists believe is that, you know, what matters are not necessarily the sort of material facts of life, but rather how those material facts are socially interpreted. So, for example, constructivists will point out that zombies are hardly the only creatures to eat people, that, you know, they're cannibals, sharks, very hungry bears. They also eat people. Right. Uh, but they're not seen as, as nearly as much of an existential threat. And the reason, of course, is that, you know, zombies, uh, you know, challenge human identity. The, the thing that you see in almost every zombie movie out there is, you know, people actually looking at the zombies feeling an instant sense of revulsion and yet at the same time a sense of identification because these used to be people. Um, so as a result, what constructivists argue is that, that, that states and individuals care very much about identity and, and adherence to clear, uh, well-articulated social norms. Do we, do we need in constructivism to assume that it, it would not be unacceptable if the zombies became the earth? Is that, is that a constructivist tenet? Well, what constructivists would argue is that there are certain norms that, you know, have, they're, they're, they're what are called norm cascades, that if you introduce a norm and it, it becomes quickly popular, then it becomes, you know, relatively speaking, uh, quickly, a, you know, a constraint on the rest of society. So there are obviously certain human norms out there that, that we all embrace right now. For example, slavery, which used to be uh, uh, widely predominant across the earth, is no longer tolerated. Right. Uh, there are other examples like that that are, that are you know, human rights, which are presumably, uh, you know, more embraced now than they used to be. The problem the problem is that if you have enough zombies out there, um, it might be the case that zombie norms wind up getting embraced. Now, you know, the, the, you might think that that would be absurd, that, you know, humans would not willingly agree to eat other people. Um, but on the other hand, there are other aspects of the zombie lifestyle that might be considered more appealing to humans. Um, zombies do not discriminate. They, they're willing to eat anything. Uh, they, they don't really care all that much about appearance uh, or personal hygiene. Um, they uh, generally travel along. They're very sociable. They, they travel in groups, and they're extremely eco-friendly. Um, they only walk everywhere, and they only eat local organic produce. Um, so, you know, in many ways, I've just described the lifestyle of your average college student, which are the key change agents in, in Western society. So you could see why there would be certain elements of, of uh, you know, advanced affluent countries that might embrace the zombie way of life. Uh, one of the scenarios uh, I've talked about over these last weeks with Gaddafi is that he survives. And that it's necessary in order to get that that resource that he has, the light, sweet, crude and the natural gas back online, is that you find a way to accommodate a man who's used his own weapons against his own people in horrible, unacceptable fashion. Is that constructivism? I don't think that would be constructivism. I actually think that would be the, the closest story there would be actually be realism. Um, you know, realists are the ones who say it doesn't matter how a leader treats his domestic population. What matters is, is, is their strategic interests, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the international system. So I don't think what you're describing would be constructivist. In fact, const uh, constructivists would be appalled by that notion because, you know, there would be such strong violations of human rights norms that even if it were in the U.S. strategic interest to do that deal, constructivists would probably argue against it. And yet uh, we have vouchsafed uh, that kind of brutality in a number of states we could name off the top of our heads without zombies these last decades because of the pursuit of natural resources. Now, zombies don't have the natural resource card, and so that complicates this story in terms of economic relationships. That's true. I mean, as I said, there, I, I know you're, you're a big fan of this, but there are areas where the metaphor uh, uh, perhaps uh, runs unless, out Unless, of course, they do have natural resources. Well, 
you can argue. I mean, one of the arguments out there is that, uh, and you see this in some of the movies, is that inevitably um, one of the resistance, the source of resistance to killing the zombies, there are two sources of resistance. Uh, very often, uh, defense corporations don't want to obliterate all zombies because they want to figure out the way to use uh, the zombie virus as a, a tool of uh, right. bio, uh, as, as a bioweapon. Um, and to some extent, uh, you know, there are ways in which you see, like in Shaun of the Dead, for example, zombies are thought of as, you know, in the end, a, a source of untrained labor, potentially. So that might also be the way in which they could be used. And, uh, Dan, when we come back to Gaddafi, who's the presenting zombie, uh, making his statements, we have no way of predicting at this point. We can eliminate Neocon. Everybody's crossed that out. We have no way of predicting how you actually defeat a zombie state. In your book, you don't have an example of a total defeat or a, a, a moving aside of a zombie. It's just, it's just uh, how to deal with them, how to get along with them. And so it's, that's what international relationships is, not victory. Well, I, I mean, there are exa- I mean, World War Z is an example of a, of a book in which, in the end, most of the zombies are, are destroyed. Um, but I not all. The, not all. No, not all. Right. I, I think one of the, the, the key things, and again, this was sort of a pleasant surprise as I finished the book, was that I decided that, in fact, the zombie, uh, the zombie canon is far too pessimistic about how humans would deal with an attack of the undead, that, in fact, humans are far more adaptable. Um, than most uh, zombie movies present them. So in, in some sense, in, in thinking about Gaddafi, I think the best thing to do is, in fact, to support those people that are actually in the country um, but opposing Gaddafi, because in some ways those are the groups that are going to have the greatest local knowledge um, and the greatest way of figuring out how to constrain this uh, uh, this dictator, um, and indeed, it's, it's, it's been interesting to watch the sort of you know spread of of the opposition t- uh, to Gaddafi, because in some ways the spread of the opposition is in and of itself very reminiscent of a zombie uprising. The book is theories of international politics and zombies, and Dan Dresner, who's a professor at Tufts, has been very generous to de- to apply his wonderful uh, uh, writing to uh, Muammar Gaddafi. I'm sure Gaddafi or his legacy at some point will enjoy this. Uh, because what and Dan is a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Zombie Research Society. I recommend this book highly for all of those who are thinking of international relations because it's not just about comedy, you understand. It's about human beings and dealing with the unacceptable. If you think zombies are unacceptable, think again. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. <laughs>